morning. We ask that you protect them and bless them this morning, Lord. Lord, we ask that you come into the building this morning. Bless Brother Mark as he leads us in our message this morning and as we celebrate communion, Lord. Lord, as we said in prayer this morning, let's run the devil out of here and bring the Holy Spirit in. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just a few things before I get started. I want to tell all of y'all that helped prepare or had a hand in it. But this past Sunday's 92nd homecoming was great for me. Three, four, one was awesome. And the dinner afterwards was great. I love real cooking, you know, like home, homemade. I'm, I'm all in on that right there. It, it was just good. And then, I, and I thought about it all week long. And then when somebody else cooks your supper, it makes it even that much better. And if you were not here for the Wednesday night spaghetti dinner, you missed a treat. Lisa Stevenson did an outstanding job on that. It was really good. So, Rhonda has been off taking care of the sick in our family, and I've been at home kind of bashing her a little bit, and I've enjoyed it. I've got to watch a lot of football this weekend. I went to the Packer game. I watched about three and a half football games last night, yesterday afternoon and last night. And uh, one thing that Kirby Smart said that is a great idea, he said, the University of Georgia is a next man up type of team. Next man up. In other words, what he was saying, when somebody like Brock Bowers goes down, they have a next man in line to take that place. So I'm telling you that to tell you this. Going forward, we have a next man up. Caden, come up here with me. I'm going to give you a few announcements. And, and Caden said, I, I want to go up there with you. Which, now, let, let me tell you all this right here. If y'all could see Gail's face right now, it, it is priceless. And I don't know if she's so nervous about what Caden's going to do or me up here leading him. I don't know what makes her the most nervous, but it's good stuff watching Gail right now. <laughs> I don't know if Caden's going to take my place on announcements or John's on the leading of the music, but this guy can sing. If y'all hadn't ever stood beside him, he can really sing. I mean, like, spot on, spot on. You do a good job. But he's going to help me with the announcements this morning. Let me borrow that for just a minute, and I'll try. And Julie does a great job, but when you give me three pieces of paper to follow, I don't follow instructions well. I'm going to do the best I can. Here's what's happening in our church this week. You figure out where you can plug in and plug in where we can. 10.30 on the 14th, 10.30 a.m. on the 14th as a ladies' prayer group. I think Becky and Rhonda and some of those are going to be in contact with you on that. Church on the Square that same Tuesday night at 7 p.m. If you don't ever take the opportunity, put yourself there. To, to sit there in front of our courthouse and it is lit up beautifully and, and you get to sing songs of praise and, and get a little bit of preaching of it's good stuff. I'm telling you, it's, if you hadn't been there, you, you owe it to yourself to go. Um, the board meeting will be on the 15th, the next day. The 19th is a Thanksgiving meal here at the church. Make sure you sign up for that because a lot of preparations have to go into that. So make sure you sign up for the Thanksgiving meal on the 19th. On the 22nd, we will not have Wednesday night church service. Uh, that's yours right there. Packers breakfast 27th. All right. All those that help feed the Packers breakfast, if our day falls on the 27th, which you know you kind of have to play it by ear, and and depending on how we win and how coin tosses go, whether we're gonna be here or there or whatever, but we will let you know in plenty of time. Those of y'all that like to come out and feed the Packers, I will tell you one thing, they enjoy it. They enjoy it. And we talked about in Sunday school this morning. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about your church being your family and your family is your church. They also, 
it gives us the opportunity to show a little bit of Jesus to the Packers. You follow what I'm saying? A little bit of Jesus to the Packers. Uh, on the 29th, it's a Wednesday night. Uh, Mitch Griffin will be here speaking. He's a, he's a local author, does a good job. He is well worth coming and seeing. And on the 30th at 5.30 in the afternoon, we're going we're gonna to decorate our church for the Christmas season. So if you can come out and help with that, y'all give my assistant a grand applause. Good job. You got anything else you got to show or tell? Is that it? All right, let's go. Church, that's our future. That's our future. A shelter in the time of the storm. Let's sing it this morning. The Lord our rock, in Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no fools affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Woe, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in time of the storm. Verse 3, the raging storms may round us be, a shelter in the time of storm. What never leaves our safe retreat, a shelter in time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of the storm. You talking about a weary land. We are living in a weary land right now. Can you believe it? And Jesus is our rock. So let's turn over one page to 572. He hideth my soul. <clears throat> Here we go, church. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with his hand 
A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock. A shadow's a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hands and covers me there with his hand. Let's stand as we sing verse 4 as we prepare ourselves for our family prayer time. Verse 4. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise, to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with a million's on high. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with His hand. Do the chorus. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with his hand amen praise the lord i'm glad that uh, my soul my life is hidden now in god with christ amen. Amen. amen and he is with us today god is for us and he is for you and uh, we're going to go to the lord Trusting Jesus Christ for great things. Amen. Right. It's good to have Vicki back there. Vicki, we are praying for you this morning. Uh, let's remember Connie in our prayer. She needs a, a touch from the Lord. And uh, Will Byrne is having a procedure this week. We're going to remember him in our prayers. Uh, do we have anyone that has a special need that you would like us to remember as we go to the <coughs> Lord in prayer this morning? I know there are many needs represented here in this church, both physical, spiritual. I know that we struggle with things. And as I was sharing with our, our group during prayer at nine o'clock, I'm sure the devil has done something this week to make you mad, stirring up things in your life. And uh, today is our opportunity to get him back. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This is our opportunity to give him a black eye, to mess with him. Now, I don't say that facetiously. We should never be uh, arrogant in our spiritual walk. We should never take light of the devil's schemes. We have a very powerful adversary. But I know we have power over the enemy this morning. I know greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Yeah. And if you're standing on the rock of Christ Jesus, I just want to encourage you to continue to stand. And when you've done everything to stand, stand firm even then. You put on the full armor of God because you have victory this morning. Don't let the devil rob you of your victory. We are here this morning because 
We are in Christ. We love Jesus. He loves us. And we have that victory. We're conquerors in Christ Jesus. Don't forget that. Like John mentioned, this world is messed up. We have battles every day. But we serve the one who has overcome all of the enemies. That's right. Amen? That's right. And he is in us. We have, we've got the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ in us. And let's pray this morning in the power of the Spirit. Let's pray in the Holy Spirit and ask the Lord just, hey, Lord, we're your people. We belong to you. We're the, we're the family of God. And we're going to do our part, which is really just having faith. But your grace is sufficient today. God's power is sufficient to overcome whatever needs to be defeated in your life. Let's join together in prayer. If you have a, a need that you want to bring to the altar, you know that the altars of this church are all, always open. And you're more than welcome to come and pray here. But let's pray in victory. Let's, the, let's, let's make the devil mad today in our prayers. He's done enough to stir us up. Let's, maybe we need to stir up the kingdom of darkness and just let them know that we know who we are in Christ Jesus. So pray with me. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We know who you are, Lord Jesus. We know your power. And we know that your word tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us. So as we pray, we exert that resurrection power, that power that brought us out of our sin that power that brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into your glorious light, that power that absolutely changed our lives from the inside out. We call upon that power, the power of Jesus Christ, to intervene in our lives today. We, we go through battles, yes. We are tempted, yes. We go through times of testing, yes. But Lord, we submit to your, your authority this morning. We submit to your lordship. And we take authority over the enemy and everything he's doing to try to ruin our lives and hinder our faith. And we rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. And we loose the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us to give us victory to encourage us today, to increase our faith, to give us more of your love and grace and mercy in our lives. Lord, we are here to represent you. We are here because we love you. We are here because you, you are the bridegroom and we are your bride. And we are looking forward to the time when you come for us and we see you face to face. And while we wait, Lord, we, we're, we're being faithful. We're going to continue to walk with you. And we are trusting you this morning for strength, for power, for grace, for all the things that we need to be victorious as we walk this spiritual life. Lord, I know you have the power to heal a body. I pray in the name of Jesus for Vicky, Vicky this morning. I pray that you touch and heal her. I pray for Connie. And for Andy, for Dave, for Wilburn, for Marcella, for all of those here this morning that need a physical touch, for, for Colleen, Lord, you are able. You are able. You're able to make the crooked ways straight. I pray for Jimmy this morning for a touch upon him. Lord, I pray for unsaved lo loved ones, sons and daughters and grandchildren, family members that need Jesus. We just believe, Lord, that you're going to save them. And even now, let your Holy Spirit remind them of who you are and your love for them and your gospel. Lord, I pray that those who are walking away from you would be miserable in their sin and that they would long for the joy of the Lord in their hearts. 
Lord, I, I pray that you'd open up the eyes of those who are blind to the truth, and that they would see you as the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, and that they would believe in you. Lord, I pray for this crazy world right now. Lord, it is in a mess, and yet you are sovereign over all things. You are, so, you are sovereign over the nations. You know what's happening with Israel and their battle against Hamas. You know the turmoil in this world. And I pray for Israel today. I pray for their victory. I pray for the enemies of, of freedom that they would be defeated. Lord, I pray for your church to rise up and for the enemies of God to be scattered. Lord, I pray for the United States. I pray for, uh, Lord, a, a revival that would come and change the heart of this country and bring it back to you. And Lord, I pray that in our own hearts we would be revived, that we, we would be empowered, that we would be full of your joy, that we would be enthusiastic and passionate about our faith. This is not something that we should just go through life thinking, okay, I'm a Christian, it's, yeah, whatever. No, this is, this is a God thing. We are yours. We serve the, the living God who is alive today. And the one King, the one Lord, Jesus Christ, you are something to be excited about this morning, and we glorify your name. We ask you to come and fill us with your Holy Spirit afresh and anew, and I pray that your Spirit would speak to us today, encourage us, open our eyes to what you want us to see, and we will give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. All right. I believe God answers prayer. Amen. You don't want to miss next week. Next Sunday during our worship service, we're going to have uh, a special guest here. Um, Beth has a dear cousin by the name of Eddie Park, Pastor Eddie Park, and he and his wife Lorena are coming to uh, visit next weekend. And while Eddie is here, I told him, you know, Eddie, you cannot come without coming up and singing and playing the piano for us. And actually, we're going to have Eddie Park in, uh, in Revival coming in January. So you'll get to see a little bit of a preview of what that's going to be like. But I'll tell you something about Eddie. Eddie is spirit-filled. He is passionate about his faith. He is in love with Jesus Christ, and he's not ashamed to let everybody know it. And when he gets up here on this piano, and he does the same thing when he preaches, he, he plays loud, he sings loud, he preaches loud. He is one fired up man. And I'm looking forward to having Eddie come and minister to us a little bit. Now, he'll be playing the piano and, uh, and singing, and I'll be preaching next week, unless the Lord has other plans. Who knows what's going to happen here? We're just going to have church, Okay. So you invite somebody, you bring them here uh, next Sunday morning, and Eddie and Lorena will be here from uh, uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina, and I am looking forward to uh, what God is going to do in this place. Um, there's a, a, a hymn that Eddie sings, and he sings it like no one else can. I don't know if you know that hymn, and I'm sure you do. My wonderful Lord, I have found a deep peace that I had never had known and a joy this world could not afford. I'll tell you, the first time I heard Eddie sing that song on the piano, I thought to myself, I have never heard this hymn sung and played like that. With a passion, it just fires me up. And every time I hear Eddie play the piano, I want him to, to sing that song and play it. My wonderful Lord, I, hopefully I, I, I get him to do that. And you'll see what I mean. He does it like nobody else, but uh, you be here next week and bring a friend or three. So one question I've been asking this morning, asked this question during our prayer time, I asked it during Sunday school, and then here this morning before our prayer, um, and I'm sure the answer is yes, has the devil done something to you this week? to make you angry, to stir you up, 
Do you sense that, for, that, that fight, that war that we go through as Christians? We see the effects of the powers of darkness at work in this world. We don't always understand the cause. Um, so many people, especially people who are not Christians, they see what's happening in the physical world or the natural world, but they have no idea that there is an unseen war taking place in this world today, a war they know nothing about. We see what's happening worldwide. Nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. It's like Jesus prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. We see what's happening with the nation Israel and this devastating attack that Hamas perpetrated upon the Jewish people. Over 1,600 people were killed. 40 babies were murdered and beheaded. It's a terrible thing. We have war that's taking place in Ukraine with Russia, and we see, uh, we see powers rising up. We see North Korea and China and uh, Iran. We see the, the, the things that we understand outwardly, things that are going on. But behind all of these powers, these men and, and individuals who are trying to gain power in this world, behind all of the, the wars that we see with our eyes, there is an unseen war taking place behind the scenes. And we need to understand that war. There's a war in this nation right now. A war between good and evil. It's more than a political war. There's a moral war taking place. And there are principalities and powers behind that war. And my dear friends, I want to tell you there's a war taking place in your soul. In your life. There's a war that's taking place against your family. Every day we go through battles. We have to fight the good fight. And I want you to understand this morning, there is an enemy of your soul that is warring against you, you today. Your spirit, your destiny. We need to open our eyes to the war, the true war that is taking place right now. Here's what the Apostle Paul had to say about this war in Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning at verse 12, he said... Now listen to this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, it's not against people, per se. It's not against those things that you see outwardly with your physical eyes. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this Darkness. It's talking about a spiritual war against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul understood that there is a real God, there's a real devil, there are spiritual forces at work, there are angels, there are demons, there are spiritual forces in high places warring against this world and warring against you. You can't see them outwardly, but they are there, trying to control what is happening in this world today. In the book of Daniel, we learned that the prophet had prayed and fasted for three weeks after asking God for direction and to maybe reveal some things about the Jewish people and their nation. And there, were, there was no answer for a while. It was delayed. And when the, when the angel of the Lord finally came to Daniel, here's his explanation of why it took so long for him to bring an answer. 
Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for uh, from the first day that you set your hearts on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. God heard Daniel's words the moment he prayed. And he sent an angel to Daniel with the answer. And the angel said, I have come in response to your words. Now, verse 13 says, but the prince of the king, king, kingdom of Persia, this is a demonic spirit, was withstanding me for 21 days. For 21 days, this angel had to contend with this demonic entity that was hindering him from coming to the prophet. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, an archangel, a more powerful angel, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings, it's plural there, kings of Persia. Principalities, powers, demonic forces, trying to hinder this angel from coming to Daniel with the word of God. You see, the prince of Persia here that this angel was speaking of was not a man. It was a demon. A demon that wanted to absolutely destroy the Jewish people. The king of Persia, or the prince of Persia, and the kings of Persia were demonic spirits that were actually warring against the nation Israel and the Jewish people. Now, behind the king of Persia in the natural, there was a, a, a man who was the king of Persia. There were evil forces at work. An unseen prince, an unseen kingdom, battling against this angel from, and hindering him from coming to Daniel. But then, again, Michael, one of the chief princes, an archangel, who was a, an angel of high ranking, came and he helped this angel. And they prevailed over these demonic entities. Now, here's an interesting side note. Today, modern-day Persia would be Iran. If you look at a, an ancient map, the different countries, you look at a modern-day map, Persia is now Iran. And it's interesting that Iran's goal is to analyze, uh, annihilate the Jewish people. So apparently this same demonic force, the kings of Persia, the prince of Persia, is still at work doing the same thing they did back in Daniel's day. Most everyone agrees that it is Iran that is ultimately responsible for the recent attacks on Israel. Their pawns in this game, if you will, are Hamas, Hezbollah, and other Islamic terrorist groups that are actually directed by Iran. But behind the scenes, there are demonic forces at work doing Satan's bidding. Now, when we talk about this unseen war and angels and demons and principalities and powers, some people, when they hear this, you know, they, they kind of think, you know, we're a little crazy. Because most people go by what they see outwardly, what they see in the natural. And when you start talking about spiritual warfare, they kind of look at you like you're crazy. But the reality is, and we know from the Word of God, and if we're Christians, we should understand that, uh, this fact that there is this unseen war taking place, controlling what, what's happening in the natural. The spiritual is controlling the natural. In our own nation, there is a, a war waging that is unseen. It is a war between God and Satan. A war between good and evil. And we know, praise God, ultimately, God will prevail. Jesus Christ will 
establish his kingdom one day, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And no one will be his rival. Amen? Are you part of that kingdom this morning? Amen. But at this current time, God allows this war to continue because this world is in a time of testing. And the ultimate purpose of this test to see, is to see who you are for. Are you for Christ or are you against Him? That is the question. I saw a commercial a little while back during the last elections. And in this commercial, it was advertising a chess set or chess set that you could play. Anybody here play chess? I'm in the right crowd. I, I can't play chess. Uh, I do good to play checkers, just so you know. But this chess set was actually like the Republicans against the Democrats. In this chess set, the, the kings in this game were Biden and Trump. And then you had queens, Nancy Pelosi. You had bishops and rooks, which were uh, cast in the likeness of Chuck, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McCon McConnell, then other key senators and, and members of Congress. And then you have the lowly pawns, which were elephants and donkeys. And they all represented, you know, the people of their respective political party. So you can get this game and you can sit down and you can play chess. You can sit down with somebody of the opposing political party for which you prescribe and see who wins. But you know, when you sit down and you play chess, none of those chess pieces move on its own. You've got to make strategic decisions. You've got to move those pieces. We see a war raging in this nation right now between the left and the right. We see a war between leaders and people and decisions and political parties fighting against each other, planning strategies and attacks. Moves are being made, but behind what you see in the natural, there are spiritual forces in the heavenlies controlling these things. You don't see them, but you see the effects. In John chapter 3, Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit. And beginning at verse 8, he said, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The moving of the Holy Spirit is like the blowing of the wind. You don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. Uh, living in southern Georgia, we have the the high, the big high pine trees. What are they? Loblollies? What do you what do you call them? Loblollies, okay. Whatever they are, when the wind is blowing strong, you don't want to walk under those trees. Because they've got large pine cones that'll fall down and knock you in the head. You see the effects of the wind. You see the pine cones falling. You see the trees swaying, but you do not see the wind itself. When the wind is blowing strong, you, you, you feel the effects even more. We don't see the Holy Spirit, but you know when He shows up. Amen? You know when God, the Holy Spirit, is with you, when you're in a worship service and the Holy Spirit shows up and things start happening and God's power is manifest. We need that, that to happen more in the church today. We need the Holy Spirit 
and His wind to blow into our church and into our lives and empower us. But all of these things speak of an unseen spiritual dimension that we don't see with our eyes, yet these things are very real. You and I are not simply flesh and blood. We're not just physical. We are spiritual beings. God has breathed upon us. He's given us life. He's given us a spirit and a soul. One day our natural bodies will wear out and fade, but our spirit, our soul will return to God. We will inherit a a glorified body someday. But my point is this. There is more to life and circumstances and happenings, whether good or bad, than what meets the eye. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Which means, if you don't have the Holy Spirit and haven't been converted to Christ, you don't have a clue as to what I'm talking about this morning. Sounds something like a science fiction novel, right? And you certainly won't have the discernment to see what God is up to and how you find yourself on His side. The natural man calls good evil, and he calls evil good. The natural man operates under the realm of man's wisdom and really cannot understand the wisdom of God. God's wisdom is discerned correctly only by those who are spiritually appraised. And that's why, church, we must be connected with Him. We must have the Holy Spirit. We must be filled with His presence and His power so that we can know how to stand when the day of evil comes. I believe God is telling His children what He's up to today. But do we have the discernment to listen? Right now we are in the epicenter of two kingdoms that are colliding, maybe like never before. And that is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. You know, God could end the conflict right now if He wanted to. He could just come down here and with one word, He could defeat all of His enemies, crush them under His feet. And one day He will. One day His anointed one, Jesus Christ, will come and rule and reign with an iron scepter, according to Psalm chapter 2. But right now we're in the middle of a, a time of testing, for those on the earth and the war, this unseen war is heating up. And you know what? There's going to be casualties along the way. But it's time for the people of God and the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and discern the times in which we live. So, who are you for today? Who are you for? In the words of the prophet Elijah, if the Lord is God, follow Him. Follow Him. If Baal is God, follow Him. Who do you believe today? Who are you for? Where do you stand? The Apostle John wrote in his day some 2,000 years ago in 1 John chapter 4, he said, beginning at verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not 
from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming. And now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. <laughs> and we all know this part. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak as from the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It's interesting that 2,000 years ago, John made the statement that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in this world. That Antichrist spirit has been here for a long time. And really, that's what this unseen war comes down to. There is the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, His kingdom, the kingdom that is for Christ, and then you have this satanic evil kingdom that is controlled by the spirit of the Antichrist. The kingdom of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ, the kingdom of Satan, the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, colliding, vying for power in this world. Christ offering salvation and hope to people. The spirit of, uh, of the Antichrist to destroy souls in hell. That's what's going on. I want to share with you just some key ways in which you can recognize the spirit of the Antichrist in this unseen war. Some key things to look for. Because again, we need to be Spiritually discerning. We need to know what's going on in this world. And a lot of this has to do with what Satan hates. What does God hate? God hates sin. God hates destruction. He hates ruined lives. Jesus came to save souls. He came, us, came to lift us up out of the pit of hell and all of our sin. He came to give us hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what we find in Jesus Christ. Satan is the destroyer. What we find in him is death, destruction, bondage. Everything that is, that is cursed. Everything that is bad. Everything that leads to, to misery. That's what he's about. Here's what to look out for. You can recognize the Antichrist spirit in this world because, number one, this spirit denies that Jesus is the Christ. Paul just spoke, or, or John talked about that in, in the scripture we just read. Any spirit that comes along and denies that Jesus is the Christ is the spirit of the Antichrist. You need to know that. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 and that name is Jesus Christ. He is not simply a Christ. He is the Christ. Jesus said in John 14.6 I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When we as Christians make this statement and our proclamation of faith that Jesus Christ is think we're better than anybody else. We don't say that to hurt anybody's feelings or offend anybody necessarily. We say that simply because it's true. Christ is the only way of salvation and He is the only one that can get you from here to heaven one day in the presence of the Father. And we know that's true because Jesus said it. And really, think about it. 
If there was any other way of salvation other than Jesus Christ, it would have been very cruel for God the Father to put His Son on a cross to suffer and die for our sins if that wasn't absolutely necessary. If there's some other way to God other than Jesus Christ and His cross, it was very cruel for the Father to crucify His Son. And ultimately, that was God's plan. You want to know why Jesus hung on that tree? It was because God the Father allowed His Son to come down into this world and pay for our sins and suffer the consequences of our sin and absorb our wrath. Jesus was on that cross for us to satisfy the justice of God. Somebody had to pay for our sins. And only Jesus Christ was qualified to do it. The wages of sin is death. And there's only one who paid that price. And his name is Jesus. And one day, one day that price will be paid for our sins. And either we can pay it ourselves in hell, or we can turn to Jesus who pays that price for us when we put our faith in him. So there's no other way to God. But the spirit of the Antichrist wants to convince you that that's a lie. That there's other ways. That you can pick your own religion. That you can get to heaven by just doing good works. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you're, you're okay. Live a good life. Be nice to people. That doesn't work. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. It'll lead you straight to hell because the fact is all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God and we get, we get saved, we get out of that mess through faith in Jesus Christ and what He did for us. God chose one way to reconcile this sinful world unto Himself and that is through the blood of the cross what Christ did there for us. Amen? So when you hear people denying that Jesus is the only way, that is the spirit of the Antichrist behind that nonsense. And I know people in church, people who go to church, who say, you know, I, I choose Jesus as my way. But I think God's going to save other people other ways too. That's a lie. We cannot, we cannot submit to that. It is a denial of the cross of Jesus Christ. Either you believe that Jesus Christ is the, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that He alone is the way to the Father, or you don't. You can't be in between. Don't be deceived by the spirit of the Antichrist. See, Satan don't care what you believe as long as you don't believe in Jesus. Because if you deny Him, that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Then he can have his, his victory in your life. But through Christ, you have power over the evil one. You have salvation, forgiveness of sin, the hope of eternal life. You've got a future in Jesus, and Satan doesn't want you to have that. So just make Satan mad this morning. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and walk with Him. Amen? Denial that Jesus is the Christ. Number two, this Antichrist spirit hates the Bible because that's where you find truth. It is a denial and despising of the Scriptures. Satan stands opposed to the Scripture. Now, he knows what the Scriptures say, probably better than we do. He knows the, the Word of God inside and out, and he believes it. He knows it's true, but he hates it. He knows there's power in the Word of God when it is believed and applied. He hates it when we become doers of the Word. And Satan knows that if he can get you to uh, reject the Scriptures, again, he can rob you of the power of God in your life. There is no true spiritual power in your words or in your opinion or in your ideas. But there is overwhelming power in the Word of God. The Antichrist spirit that is working in this world, this unseen war, wants to convince you that the Bible isn't true. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Reject it. Believe 
the Bible. Stand on the Scriptures. Build your life on the truth of God's Word. His inspired, holy Word. You build your life on the Word of God and the rock of Christ Jesus, and you will never be put to shame. Amen? So we in this church believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is true from Genesis to Revelation, and we stand on the Word of God. Some people say, well, I believe certain scriptures. I believe some of the scriptures. I believe in the scriptures that I agree with. I follow all the red letters of the Bible because that's what Jesus said. I'll, I'll stand on the red letters. Well, let me tell you, whether it's in red or black, it's all the Word of God. And whether Jesus spoke it or Paul spoke it, it comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from God. And we stand on the whole truth of God's Word. Amen? Amen? The Antichrist spirit doesn't want you to do that. But then you're not going to listen to that spirit, are you? Amen. Let's build our lives on the Word of God. Number three. Satan absolutely hates the church. He wants to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Satan hates the redeemed of the Lord. Satan hates the bride of Christ just as much as he hates the bridegroom. And his aim, listen to me, church, Satan's aim is to destroy your faith and pull you away from God. This is why we as Christians have become the most persecuted people on the planet. You know, throughout the ages, the last 2,000 years of of the existence of the church of Jesus Christ, there have been many martyrs of the faith, many people who have died for their faith. But did you know that in the last century, more people have died as martyrs for their faith than all of the rest of the 1900 years of church history? Satan knows that his time is short. We are his enemies. He wants to destroy us. Because we represent Jesus Christ. We know the truth. We've been born again. We are not of this world. We do not follow the spirit of the Antichrist. We follow Jesus Christ. And we are a threat to His kingdom. Satan hates the church. When you see persecution of Christians, you know who is behind it. Jesus said, you'll be hated by all nations because of me. But we stand with Christ. It's not about who likes you and who doesn't, or what the world thinks about you. We Christians, we Christians care about what God thinks. Our love for Jesus Christ is prevalent in our lives. And it is His opinion that matters in the end. So the church must stand for Christ knowing that we'll be persecuted, knowing that we'll have resistance, knowing that we'll be going through battles. But we will prevail. Again, as, as John said, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen? Hatred of the church. Number four. We've seen this throughout history. This antichrist spirit that comes from Satan absolutely hates the Jewish people. There are many promises that still apply to the Jewish people in the Word of God, including their redemption during the Great Tribulation. You know, if Satan could destroy the Jewish people, he could make God out to be a liar uh, because the Bible talks about the restoration of Israel and how all Israel will be saved. But throughout history, Satan's goal has been to Destroy the Jewish people. We saw that back in your Bible in the days of Esther, uh, how uh, Haman wanted to kill Mordecai and all of the Jewish people. But God turned the tables, used Esther to rise up in her day, and he saved the Jewish people. But we see that throughout history. We saw it in the Roman Empire under some of the emperors. 
We saw it uh, in, in more recent times, uh, World War II with Hitler and the Nazis trying to destroy the Jewish people. And now today we see it uh, uh, through some of the Islamic nations that want to annihilate Israel, especially Iran. And again, the recent terrorist attacks by Hamas and Hezbollah. But behind all of this, there is this unseen war, these spiritual forces at work, the Antichrist spirit. Satan always hates the same things throughout the generations. He's always hated Christians. He's always hated the church. He's always hated you. He always hates Jesus. He hates the Jewish people. He hates everything that God loves. And he's still doing the same thing. And today we see uh, as Israel is engaged in war with Hamas and the, the Gaza Strip, we're beginning to see so many protests against Israel and the Jewish people and the spirit of anti-Semitism. And that is all controlled by Satan. You need to know that. There's an unseen war. You wonder, how, how can people be that way? There is a, a spiritual battle taking place. And it's interesting that your Bible talks about in the last days, all of the nations will rise against who? Israel. And we see that happening today. And you and I, beyond the headlines, behind, behind what we watch on the news, we've got to understand something about this spiritual war that's going on and realize that satanic forces are rising up. John talked about the spirit of the Antichrist. That spirit is here at work in our world today, and one day it will culminate in a kingdom where a man will rise up who will be the Antichrist, who will try to rule this world during the last days, the great tribulation. And that we need to be aware of what's happening behind the scenes. Hatred of the Jewish people. Number five, hatred of innocent life. Hatred of the sanctity of life. I want to tell you something. Life is a precious gift from God. And Satan is all about death. Jesus is about life. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Yet the thief comes to kill, rob, and destroy. Satan hates life. He hates innocent life. Whether it's abortion, abuse of children, murder, any unjust killing of another person, it is Satan who is behind it. God is the author of life. The devil is the source of destruction. We need to be discerning. We live in a, in, a, in a country that allows abortion in so many places. And I thank God that Roe versus Wade was overturned. And that more and more states are allowing the uh, anti-abortion laws to come into place. And we can stand up for the pro-life position. And that's the position of the Church of the Nazarene. We, re we read in Psalm 139 that uh, God is the one who creates that un unborn baby in the mother's womb. David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully created. You knit me together in my mom's womb. And all my days were ordained by thee before one of them came to be. God does that. God does that. Satan wants to destroy those lives. He wants to destroy our children, our families, our grandchildren. He's all about destruction. He wants to corrupt innocence. That's what he's doing today in so many ways. And you and I are involved in this war. and It's not just against people. We see it outwardly, but there's an, there, there's an unseen war against innocent life. Children, our children, born and unborn. And we must fight for those who are helpless and innocent during this time. Number six, almost done here. Hang in with me. 
just a few more minutes. Number six, there is a hatred of all that is holy. The Bible says, in fact, the Lord himself said, Be holy, for I am holy. Satan hates holiness. He doesn't want the church to be holy. He doesn't want, he doesn't want you to think you can be holy. And you can never be holy in your own power, but you can be holy if you've got the Holy Spirit. If you allow God to sanctify you through and through. He'll do it. We can live holy lives that are pleasing to God. We can be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God through His power. Not our own. But Satan wants you to think that you're never going to be holy. He wants you to hate holiness as much as he does. He wants you to, to, to chase after things that are vile and impure and uh, things that God uh, despises.